right. Well, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 21, please. And we're going to dig into this week's Torah portion. Yahweh is so good, and we're going to do this at a later point, but I just want to say uh, thank you to uh, the gentlemen that are working on the third floor. And if I could just have you stand, uh, if, you were, uh, if you are Michael Gregory or Ted Patterson or Curtis Liebel, would you guys stand? These are our three contractors hit up by Curtis that have been working feverishly on the third floor for five months now. Two of them moved down here not having a job and within one week one of them was one day after he moved here uh, they ended up being the ones that Yahweh chose and they did an unbelievable job and they know how picky I am and I will tell you they have far exceeded my expectations uh, it is not often that I find individuals that can do that and uh, and they did hands down and so I want also, if you were a volunteer here in the room that worked on the third floor, would you stand as well? Because you deserve recognition. I know there was a lot of people, even people that, that uh, I know there's quite a few in here. Come on, guys, don't be bashful. Thank you so much for your volunteer work. People even uh, drove out here from the East Coast and worked here for days at a time just to be here and be part of that project that will never happen again. And so um, we just are so thankful for that. Okay, Ki Tetze. That's the tour portion that we're going to be talking about today. And uh, the rebellious son, Deuteronomy chapter 21. There's so many things to talk about. We're not going to be able to get through the entire tour portion. We never do. We are going to try to break our record of 10 verses and uh, see how far that we get. But how many know that whatever happens in the physical realm happens in the spiritual realm? Amen? Well, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of being impressed right now to remind myself, uh, the Lord's reminding me to share something very significant that happened to me uh, this last week. And so I just want to share this with you. Um, many of you know that every once in a while, uh, you know, the Lord gives me a, a prophetic vision or a dream or something like that. But I have never experienced a passion for truth in our, in our staff meetings, which we are going to start recording, because every once in a while, about every, almost every one, something unbelievable happens, and we all go, I can't believe we're not recording this. So much revelation comes uh, from our staff meetings. There, I don't even think we talk, we don't ever talk about work. Uh, the whole thing is all about what the Lord is doing, and, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, there are so many visions and dreams that people are having and they're all connected. It's so almost eerie. If I wasn't knowing that I'm connected to the Most High, I would be scared. And I'm serious because the dreams are connected in so many ways. Well, I, I can't, there's no way for me to go through the, the two or three dreams that people had this last week that were on our staff and how they were connected to, to what the Lord is doing and, and even uh, my personal life. Uh, but I do want to share something that happened to me personally that has never happened. Out of every dream, out of every vision, out of every uh, prophetic word that Yahweh has given me for myself or for someone else, I've never had what happened to me this last week. And I don't know, because ever since I had that basketball accident, which I don't know if it's connected or not. Maybe the Lord just knocks some sense into me. I don't know. I know that my parents have been waiting their whole life for that moment to happen, uh, as every parent does their child, right? And... Um, but something's happened to me that has caused me to be, I feel different. And here's what happened. I had, um, I can't say it's an out-of-body experience because I've never had one. But this was as, the most powerful vision I've ever had in my life. And I've had some pretty incredible visions. This one was very short and, and very powerful. Where all of the other ones were visions of, of uh, as you know, of you know, like a piece of bread and a loaf of bread and all the details and a sword and a person and, and this and that and a field and the enemy uh, and every other detailed dream or vision. This one was just a beam of light that was like, uh, like a, it was a vertical line. 
and it was it wasn't blinding because it was going past me but it was like I could see the side of it you know if you take a, a flashlight and you point it at yourself it'll blind you but if you point it just a little bit you can see the side of it well it was the crack of a door if you open a door just a crack and it's totally pitch dark on your side it would put a beam of light okay well, I was standing off to the side and, and this beam of light went flying past me and I knew that it was on the other side was it was God I knew that it was Yahweh this light how did I know that here's how because the light did not touch me it went past me but just the indirect beams of the light completely encapsulated my emotional system and shut down every thought every negative thought every hurt every bitterness every anger it completely overwhelmed my system just the let's say uh, the glory from the edges of this light and what it did was it instantly all of the all of the hurt from those that have hurt me all of the people that have been uh, you know uh, what we consider you know enemies to the forwarding of this message all the people on YouTube that are hurt, you know, saying hurtful things and, and making up things about this ministry. You can imagine if you had somebody constantly 24 hours a day, even right now, they're watching right now, recording, looking for something. That's how the evil inclination, they're looking for something. That's what Hasatan does, by the way. And all of that hurt that, that, that went deep down inside of me that I thought I had let go intellectually instantly was gone. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Because what mattered was the fact that this light was so powerful that it showed me through the illumination into my whole entire emotional system that from when I was a child, I was treated unfairly. My mother would even attest to this. I was always held to a higher standard, whether it was a teacher or a pastor or a youth group leader. Anybody else out there like that where two people can do the same thing and you're the one that gets in trouble, right? Well, not only would I was the one to get in trouble, but they, they would find out this person did it too, and they would let them get away with it, but I couldn't get away with anything. And so over the last 30 years of my life, because I'm thir turning 39 in a couple of weeks, over the last 39 years of my life, I have literally thought, life is unfair. God must hate me. I must be the worst person on the earth because I'm treated as if I am God. No one could, could hold the standard that I have been held to since I was eight years old. And so I began to have a very critical spirit. So those of you that knew me back in my day, this is where it came from. It came from the fact that I was put uh, in a position that nobody could hold to. And so when I made the mistakes that any natural person would make, or even as a public speaker, you speak long enough, you will eventually take your foot off, not just your shoe, and you'll eat both, right? And so what would happen is I would be held to the standard that nobody else could hold to, and I would be bitter. And I would start holding people to this standard and be highly critical. Now, there's a difference between wanting to have excellence and critical, okay? So just because there is an excellence does not mean that you're critical. It means that Yahweh says, this is the standard. He's not being critical. He says, this is the standard. It's excellence. You need to run the race to win that is not, uh, you know, someone that is, is critical. He's saying, this is what I, my goal is for you. This is where we want to go. But I went beyond that into a critical spirit. So in this supernatural experience that was as close to an out-of-body that I've ever had in my life because it was so real, it melted me instantaneously when I, when I saw this vision. Because I, it wasn't something I saw. Like other visions, I see it. Boom, boom. It's like a download, like a flash drive in, the, in, in my rib. This one was like, I was in it. I was in the vision. And, and that's why I say I, I don't never experience an out-of-body experience. But, but in this moment, when this light came over me, and I just had just the remnants of this beam of light, all of these feelings and hurts came instantly to the surface. And all of the questions instantly came to the surface. No different than people that have died. And if you watch on YouTube, their near-death experiences. And they all, this very similar story. And Yahweh answered it instantaneously. All of the questions, I can't, it's, it's very hard to explain.
But all of the questions came at one time, and it was as if I heard every question independently, and I could understand every question I've ever had independently, even though they were being asked all at the same time. And the answer was one answer to every question that I ever had. And the answer was this. It was me. Yahweh said, they were not the ones judging you. They were not the ones holding you to a higher standard. They were not the ones being unfair. It was me. I was the one that was holding you to a higher standard. Because if you were held to a regular standard, then you would be a regular guy. Because the world can only take you as far as the world goes. But I want to take you to a different place. Does this make sense? So it made my whole life make sense. The things that have happened to my life in the last couple of years that have been the most traumatic and painful things I have ever experienced. How many have had family members that have disowned you when you came into your Hebrew root? I know that feeling of having your parents be completely against everything you stand for. And my God said this, it was me. How do you do that? How do you swallow that kind of phrase? Because the flesh wants to point to flesh. And I preach that God is sovereign and every step that a man takes, if a righteous man takes, is ordained by the Lord. But did I really believe that? Because I can intellectually read the Bible and try to figure out and believe it, but it's a whole nother thing to truly believe it on the inside out. That there's no person that can throw a stone against you without getting his approval. There's not a weapon, finish it for me, that would be formed against you that can stand, comma, let's add in a bunch of context from other scriptures that aren't there, unless he approves it. So if a weapon forms against you and it stands, he sent it. Or he allowed it to be sent. And so when that bazooka gets pointed your way, no fear, look dead into the, the, the cavern of that, into the point of that bullet, or that, in my case, cannonball. Bullets would be nice for a change. But look down that barrel and wait for Yahweh. Because if the trigger gets pulled and the cannonball comes out, one of two things are going to happen. Either it's going to hit you and you're going to learn something from that. Like duck. <laughs> or it's going to get rerouted around you. Never duck. When Yahweh doesn't say duck. Point is this. Yahweh says the same thing to you. He does not want the world to raise you. And for most of you... Before I start my message, this is the pre-message, from Yahweh, I believe to you, he wants to say, the world and the religious systems have raised you. They have raised you to a standard that's here. And Yahweh says that that is not my standard. My standard is here. My standard is at a place that you say that you can't reach. Good, then you'll require me to help you. If you can reach the standard, it is a tradition and doctrine of men. Because Yahweh created the standards not to be reached without His help. This is the walk of faith that we are missing in this movement. Because people want to look at the tangible black and white Word of God and they would appoint to in a commandment and say, you've got to do this commandment. And our Christian brothers and sisters are dead right. You can't. You will never 
be able to keep a commandment to the degree that it was originally given. Never without His help. This, my friends, is why on Shavuot, 30 AD, when, 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 the, when, when the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, came down on the disciples, and Yeshua said, go and tarry for 50 days, and then when the 50 days are over, I'm going to send you a comforter. And that comforter is going to comfort you from what? From your physical pains of this earth? Or from the fact, that's a physical person, a person that is walking in the natural what they're looking at the Holy Spirit for is a, gl a glorified Santa Claus or a tooth fairy that's going to pat you on the back and tell you, oh, you're doing okay. It's okay. You're fine. That hurt that you have, your broken leg, I'm here for you. And I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. But if you are a spiritual person, you do not care about the comforts of this world or how you feel. What you truly care about is, Father, how do I please you? I can't. Help me. The spiritual person says, I want to reach this, and I can't. So would you comfort me and help me and teach me all things? Teach me how to reach for the next rung. Wherever you are, your job is to reach for the next rung. Yahweh says this, for those of you that get depressed about your spiritual walk, which is every single person in here, if you're spiritual, because you should never be satisfied for where you're at. I've been in ministry long enough that when I get excited and feel like everything's going good, I get on my face and duck. Because Abba knows I'm one half a step away from pride. I am convinced that all those that can't stand me, this ministry, the message, they are the best friends I've got. Edit that one. Because why? With every video they make, it crushes me. It humbles me. It hurts me. And it makes me cry out to my God. So the question becomes for Jim Staley, do I really want it to stop? Am I not supposed to be crushed? Am I not supposed to be humbled? Am I not supposed to cry out for my God? And what does the Scripture say? Where you are weak, He is strong. So why do we try to be strong? Why do we put on the faces? Why do we stick our chest out? Why do we desire things to go good? Why do we desire our path to be straight? Why do we desire no mountains? Why do we complain in the valleys? We complain on the mountains. We complain in the valleys. And so there's only one place left. And it's the desert. And guess where most of us live? Because there's no place that we call home. Ladies and gentlemen, the home is wherever the Father has you. Whether you've got, like me, a thousand people that point their swords, or whether you're in a closet and nobody knows who you are, be thankful that you are serving and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah is with you. And if He is with you, no one can be against you. You see, if they were smart, they would let back. Because if I'm wrong, and I'm as prideful as they say, there is a huge fall coming to my life. But if they judge me now, and I'm a man of pride, as they say, then Father removes the judgment. This is what happens in the spiritual realm. These are the laws of the spiritual realm. Yahweh moves upon those that are humble and He refrains His judgment from those that have been unrighteously judged. One last thing. Abba wants you to know. 
there are lots of different people on lots of different rungs of the ladder. Do not, if you are on level 10 in an area, do not criticize or judge the person that's on level 1. This is what I've done my whole life. I've been held at a level 10 in about every area. And so people would be at a level 1. I'd say, why are you at a level 1? What's wrong with you? Isn't everybody supposed to be up here? And I wasn't even here. I just knew that I was supposed to be here. What your job is, is to get people to the next rung. Encourage people to the next rung. When you're, when you're, there's evangelism 101. And one of these days I'm going to give an evangelism class on how to share this message with people. Evangelism 101. Never try to score. Write it down. Never try to score. What are you talking about? Our job is to convert them. No, it's not your job. Your job is not even convince them of anything. Your job is to get them from the one-yard line to the two-yard line. And if Abba gives you permission and great favor, you might get to the five. And then Yahweh might say, sit down. You can only go to the five-yard line because I've orchestrated someone else to take them to the 50. But we get frustrated. And when we only get so far with someone, we get frustrated, don't we? Because they're not hearing us. Take that as your hint from the coach. He's trying to tell you, sit down. You've taken them as far as you can go. Get a clue. They're not calling you back. Take a clue from the physical realm. It's a spiritual message. If Yahweh's not giving you favor with someone to share the gospel or the message of the front of the book, take it as a hint. You're not the guy. You're not the gal. And pray for someone else to walk in. Have the humility to back down and let another player play. Don't try to be an all-star running back. If you get clobbered three times in a row, you probably ought to sit down and ask the water boy for help. You might need a little water. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Let's get into the Word. Deuteronomy chapter 21. That was for free. <laughs> the law conserved concerning unsolved murder. You know, in this Torah portion, this week's Parsha, there is more commandments packed into this place, into this section, than any other Torah portion combined. Bar none. There's like 76 laws, I think, that are found in this Torah portion alone. It's bam, 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 bam. And you walk through them, and some of them are, are confusing. And so we're, there's no way we're going to be able to go through all of them. Uh, but I think we are going to unpack some of them that are uh, apparently confusing uh, on the, uh, uh, the surface. And I believe some of them will actually relate for today. Um, okay, I'm getting another impression. Sorry, commercial number two. I need to understand, I need to explain a little bit about Torah and, um, excuse me. And these laws uh, that are encased in it, okay? You have the, uh, the Malkit Zedek laws, the laws of the kingdom, the laws of the garden, the laws all the way up to the laws of, of Levi, Levitical priesthood. And you have the commandments that were given on Mount Sinai. And then you have all of the commentary that Moses had to add under the inspiration of Yahweh because of sin. You get that. In the New Testament, what's it say? It says the law was added because of our transgression. So let me ask a question. If there was no transgression, there would be no law. Got it? In the New Testament, remember when it says that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and goes through all the gifts of the Spirit, and it says, against these, what's it say? There is no such law. Well, that can be really confusing. Why are you trying to say there is no Torah? What it's trying to say is if you could walk in that, there would be no necessity for the Torah. None. This is why when the kingdom comes, most of the Torah will not apply. 
There will not be any divorce. So all the divorce laws are gone. Won't be polygamy. All those particular laws are gone. No hate. So you erase all of the it's selfishness. You er, every single sin that you erase, you're erasing a law. So you, I want you to get the proper perspective because there are a lot of people teaching the Torah from the perspective of its Genesis to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy as the five books of Moses, and that is going to be eternal. The law is not eternal. Soundbite that. The word of God is eternal. There is a difference. The law of God only exists as long as man is in its sinful place. The closer we come to the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, what happens at the end? There is what? A new heaven and a new earth. All things will become new. The closer that we get to that time period of what's called the eighth day, when the priest actually is inaugurated to be able to, you as priests, the kingdom of priests, by Torah, are inaugurated into your servanthood. The thousand years is just a training ground. That seventh day is a day of standing and resting, waiting for the eighth day of inauguration, according to Torah. But the closer that we get to that, the more of the Torah goes backwards. So it works like this. This is the beginning of time. This is the end of time. Did I do that right from your perspective? On the left, right? Okay. So this is the beginning of time. This is the end of time. The closer that we get to the beginning of time... The Torah, or the end of time, the, or, the Torah goes this way. Until when you get to the very end of time, you get to the beginning of time. Let me say that again. You start from the beginning of time. Uh, creation, Genesis chapter 1. You start out here with how much of the Torah? Very little. You had the sacrificial laws, we know that, uh, but they weren't developed because we know that uh, that Cain and Abel and the sacrificial system, there was unclean, there was clean, there was the Shabbat laws, there was the dietary laws, we know that, all, all the way up to the time of Noah. He knew clean and unclean, what can eat, what he couldn't eat. So we had the basic fundamentals of the Torah, should I say what we kind of believe in and are all doing, hopefully. But as time went on, what happened to man? Man began to go downhill, began to sin more. So what happened? The Torah had to be increased. More laws had to be added because man was going in the wrong direction. How many laws do you give a teenager that's perfect? Seriously, look at how we do it in real life. My oldest is, is, in my opinion, unbelievably as close to a perfect teenager as you can get. She's responsible, she's disciplined, she loves Yahweh, she studies the Word, she knows the Word, she's a great example for her, for her siblings. She even instructs me on what to do. She's one of my counselors, along with the other five. Not a whole lot of laws I need to give. But the more that, a, that a, a child goes wayward, the more laws and restrictions you give them. And so listen to what I'm getting ready to say because I believe this is under the unction of the Holy Spirit. We keep focusing on all of the independent details of the law as if that is what God really wants. What He wants is back here. Where we're focusing in this movement is the wrong place. We're focusing here at the height of all of the nuances of the law because of all of the sin. And God says, when I talk about restoration, when I talk about recalibration, when I talk about uh, uh, recalibrating to the very beginning, on which time scale do you think that he wants to go? Here, in the thick of all the skin, uh, of all the sin, and say, this is what I want you to do? Or here? Does he want you in the garden or on top of Mount Sinai? Ladies and gentlemen, the Hebrew Roots movement's not the last movement. Because the focus is on Mount Sinai. 
And Yahweh wants you in the garden. And Yahweh doesn't even want you in the garden. He wants you in the midst of the garden. Because they were born in the Garden of Eden, if you will. But he took them from the garden and put them in the midst of the garden. It was the picture of the holy place and the holy of holies. Outside the garden is the outer courts. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been living in the outer courts. We don't even know where the holy place is. When you walk into the holy place in the real temple, there's only two items. You look to your left and you see the menorah casting its light on the table of showbread. The simplicity of Yahweh and His Word could not be more clear. It is the Spirit. Have you ever wondered why there's seven churches in Revelation and seven spirits of God? There's seven candlesticks on the menorah representing the Word of God. The Spirit of Yahweh, the Ruach HaKodesh, casting its light, its fire, onto the only thing that matters. The simplicity of the Word of God. Bread. Now, if I'm God, I'm going, hey, this is my chance when I'm designing the tabernacle. I'm going to put the menorah on one side, and I want to illuminate the Torah scroll. Come on, wouldn't that be logical too? I mean, let's just be honest. That's logical, and it would be very cool on TV. We could pan from the light over the Hebrew letters of the Torah scroll. Why did he choose? Even in Solomon's temple, same thing. He could have chosen a Torah scroll. The Hebrew Roots Movement would have chosen a Torah scroll. I can guarantee you that. But Yahweh chooses to use one simple artifact. Bread. Why? Because in the physical, there's a spiritual message. If you understand bread, bread does not come from wonder. Today, children, if you're under 30, you didn't even get that. <laughs> and it doesn't come from bunnies either, right? <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> it's a good thing you did, could not hear that at home. Could not hear that. But when you go back 2,000 years, bread is significant because bread comes from wheat. And that was something that every Israelite saw once a year. And wheat comes from a seed that's planted in the ground in the fall. And it dies. It has to die. It's one of the only seeds that has to die. It has to actually completely die and the shell break open from rot and it's only when the shell breaks open and it finally dies and gives up that the water that's encased Yahweh's so smart he put a little drop of water inside the seed but it means nothing until it breaks the seed has every single thing that it needs to produce what will go into the holy place and the priest will eat but until it dies it doesn't mean anything this is why you're called wheat. This is why I'm called wheat. Because we have everything we need inside of us to produce that which is holy for the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, the high priest to eat. But until you die to yourself and get over yourself, until you completely give up and surrender everything you've ever wanted and the motivations of your life, that you don't even know, some of you, which are evil because we don't know our own hearts. I don't know my own heart. This is why Yahweh has to constantly pound me. Because I'm one half a step away from pride, just like you. But in the pounding, when I say, Father, I can't take it anymore, I quit 
and I open my chest and I stop being fake and I op- take off the mask, the seed that has everything it needs to have, if I, there's only one single thing that's missing inside that seed. Oxygen. When it breaks open and the oxygen hits that seed, it germinates it, opens it up, and it finally begins to shoot its way through the ground and it pops up through the ground and eventually it will grow and it will be mature. And right at the time when everyone goes, it's beautiful, the sickle of Yahweh comes and cuts it down again. Sound like familiar life, right? This is why I say when things are going good, pull over on the side of the road, get on your face. Because Abba's about to come by and he's going to cut you down again on purpose. Because you're not meant to be a seed and you're not meant to be wheat. Then he cuts you down. You're like, oh, Lord, why are you cutting me down? I I finally matured. I'm holy. And he says, no, that's only stage one. I'm cutting you down. And then what what happens? He's going to take you and he's going to take a stone and he's going to crush the mature part of that wheat. The stone that the builders rejected in their life has become the chief cornerstone that brings life. That's why Yeshua says, unless you trip over me now, unless you stumble over me now, you will be crushed by the same stone when I come again. The wheat is then crushed with stone till all the chaff and and the seeds are all separated, but they're all still together. And you're going, oh, this feels so terrible. Please stop, Yahweh, stop. Stop. I can't take it anymore. How many times have I yelled out in my bed, stop? How many times have you yelled out in your bed, stop? When his whole entire intention and motivation is to make you into what you're created to be. And he's doing it. So then he takes all of this and you're on a half of a side of a hill. You're, on, you're right be, uh, uh, below the top of a hill in Jerusalem where the threshing floor is. And they're threshing the wheat and it's crushing it. And when it's complete, they go right below it because the wind is just perfect in Israel right below the top of a hill to where when they throw the seed and the chaff together up in the air, The air separates the light chaff from the wheat and you end up with two piles. That's how easy it is. You throw the seed with the chaff, everything that was crushed, put it all together, throw it in the air, you have two piles. One is burned. This is why it doesn't matter what the tares are because it all gets crushed together. Every bit of it gets crushed. And both end up in two piles. And it's so clear which is the seed. And do you know what separates the seed? It's not a human being that goes around saying, you've got sin in your life. That pastor's got sin in his life. Jim Staley doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just prideful. Let's just put a video up on YouTube. Or that person at my work, or they're, they're prideful, or this person is this, or that person is this. You're separating the seed, and you do not have the right to do that. There is only one entity in the world, in the universe, that's been given the right to separate seed from chaff. And that is the wind. And in Hebrew, that word is ruach. It is the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit in English, that has the right to separate good from evil. He does not need your help. He is more than capable of separating. 
Can I dare say, we don't even go, let me go one step forward, we don't have the right to look at tele, even televangelists, Joel Olstein, and call them a wolf. You're separating seeds. How do you know that Yahweh is not using these televangelists to reach people with the very basics, okay, albeit super basic, of the gospel? Of someone you'll never reach. Are you in Tanzania sharing the gospel in their language? Are you in Bulgaria, Estonia, Russia, Sweden? Are you in every language? Because some of these televangelists are in all the languages. And I am certainly not condoning their theology, or what they say 100% of the time. But what I can say is you're not, and they are, reaching the gospel into those places. So let me say what Paul said. Whether by truth or pretense, I praise God that the gospel is being preached. Yahweh one day will crush and throw into the air and the Holy Spirit will separate on that day the goats on this side, the sheep on this side. He will burn everything that is not of Him. I guarantee it now. So why do you feel such a need to burn someone now? With your lips, Matthew says, you will be justified. And with your lips, you will be condemned. How many know that we are right now in what month on the Hebrew calendar? We are in the month of Elul. The harvest month. Nearing the harvest. Elul, they say, the ancient sages say, it's an acronym in Hebrew that means, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. From the Song of Solomon. And the month of Elul is connected to one single word. Teshuva. Everybody say, Teshuvah. Teshuvah. That's right. Teshuvah means to turn. It means to repent. It means to turn back to your Creator and turn away from everything that's unholy. It is a time where all war stops. Nobody points fingers during the month of Elul if you know the Torah. You don't point, you're not supposed to point the fingers anytime. But this is a heightened sense In Judaism, the ancient sages will tell you, even today they will tell you, that if you're at war with your neighbor, it stops for 40 days of Elul. No one goes to war during the month of Elul. There are peace treaties that are signed, and everyone drops to their knees and looks at themselves. How many times have you seen a movie where this happened in real life? They'll show you something that happened, you know, uh, a movie that's maybe set back 1,500 years. And the two sides are at war, right? And all of a sudden, you know, something happens. Boom. Everybody stops. Everybody, you know, they shake hands. Hey, how you doing today? You know, it's good to see you, blah, 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 blah. And like the buzzer goes back off and now they start fighting again. That's what it's supposed to be like. Except you're not supposed to fight, Period. The month of Elul. Why is it a time of introspection, interreflection? Because the sages know exactly what's coming one day in the future. They know that the next, fall, the next feast day of the fall is Yom Terah on Tishrei 1, which is the next month. Right after Elul, it goes Tishrei 1. And on Tishrei 1, they know this is when the Messiah comes. The Messiah will come. He will be coronated as king, and you better be ready. And so the month of Elul, that month before the king comes, if you knew the king was coming in 30 days, you probably would spend a little more time in prayer and repentance and less time aggravating your neighbor. (laughs) You probably would not even be on YouTube, God forbid, or television, or listening to the radio. You probably have long extended times of prayer and fasting, wouldn't you? That's what this time is about. It's a time of prayer, fasting, reflection, 
It says, the things that I've done yesterday, I am going to begin the process of making right and not doing them again. Because the new year is coming. The civil year is coming on Tishrei 1. The agricultural and religious year starts on Nisan 1, but the governmental king years start on Tishrei 1. They overlap just like the United States government in the calendars. So we get ready for that time by looking within ourselves. We don't look at our neighbors. We don't point fingers at, ourselves, at, 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 our, at our spouse. We point them at ourselves. Matter of fact, the most popular way to practice this during this month is this. Is wait for the next argument. For some of you that will be on your way home. <laughs> Hopefully it's not right now. You're like, like elbowing each other right now. <laughs> Sometimes I see jerks. Not real jerks, but like little jerks in the audience. And, what are they doing? Wait for the next, uh, look, so you got the husband and spouse, they're like five feet away, man. They're like, you guys must be in it right now. Marriage counseling 101, here we go. Prayer partners. Just kidding, just kidding. Praise God we don't have a camera that's on you right now. But the best way to practice teshuva and repentance is this. Wait for your next argument. Wait for the next time that you are highly offended or aggravated. And that is your opportunity to go, it's me. It must be me. I think it's me. It must be me. It is me. Default to what they're thinking and you win. You can read minds. Because in the middle of an argument, that's what they're thinking. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. So just agree and go on with life. It's really hard to argue with someone that agrees with you. If my wife were ever to say that I was a jerk, which has never happened, today, no, I'm just kidding. But if she has ever said that, I agree. Because I am. If she believes that I'm being mean in that moment, I probably am. So why not just admit it instead of argue something that they see that I don't? So this is your opportunity during the month of Elul to practice what we say we believe. If you want to go back to the garden, we need to start heading there. And when you get to Mount Sinai, stop, pause, reflect, tip your hat, and keep walking. Because that's not the end game, my friends. Let me just prove it to you. The kingdom of God is not going to come down on Mount Sinai. He is not trying to get us back to the base or the top. He's trying to get us back to the promised land, into the garden. Remember, if Mount Sinai was the promised land, he would have put it in the promised land. It's not the final goal. Matter of fact, I will just uh, make an obvious deduction from this very Greek reasoning. It's the beginning. Because it happened in the beginning of their journey. The Torah is only the beginning. It is not the end. Is this making sense? The Torah is not what you look at so intently with awe and you just, you can't wait to do it. That's a great start. That is an immature start. And that's where most of the Hebrew Roots movement is right now. It's the, I, I want to do it. I've got to figure out how to do it. That is a great start. But that is not what Yahweh's intention is. Yahweh's intention is for the, you see, that, that demeans the Torah. When you say that God just wants me to keep the Torah. That means you do not understand the Torah. The instructions is what that word means in Hebrew for those of you that are just with us for the first time. The purpose of the commandment, the purpose of the instruction manual is far more powerful, ladies and gentlemen, than it's black and white may suggest. Because before it was black and white, it was infinite 
So in all our looking, that's the very beginning. But what Yahweh's purpose behind it is this. He wants the Torah to change you. It challenges you. It's not a piece of paper. It's the Messiah in the canvas. It is the Messiah written on the lamb skin that you are looking at. When you're trying to keep it, you should say, Father, teach me, for I know not even what I do. Assume that you're the one crucifying him. And you will always be on his good side. Spend your life crucifying someone else. And you are able and apt to find yourself shoulder to shoulder with a Roman centurion on judgment day. The father says, take this time serious. Spend time in prayer and fasting. This has gotten so serious for us at Pastor for Truth and our staff that we have decided to reenact, to reinstate the Nehemiah challenge. Every Tuesday we'll be fasting. Every day we are spending an hour in prayer. In 30 minutes in His Word. All the way through the feast days until Yom Kippur. And I want to ask you to join us for this solemn, powerful corporate time of fasting and prayer that Nehemiah called. We're just calling out what he did for his people. What Esther did for Yahweh's people. Put aside the deeds of the flesh. When you stop eating, you're physically dying. If you fast long enough through the law of extrapolation, which I love to talk about, it makes everything easy when you do it. If you fast long enough, you die. So when you fast, this is why Yahweh says, it is a fast like this that breaks the yoke of the enemy. Because the Torah says that it only has authority over you while you're living. So when you die through fasting, the enemy has no power to convict you of anything that you don't even know you should be convicted of. There's silence in the heavenly realm as the prosecuting attorney, Hasatan, tries to beat you down and convince Yahweh through chapter and verse, which he's so good at because he knows it all, and says, Jim Staley broke this chapter, this verse, and this thing. And I've come into a fast of repentance and teshuvah. Yahweh says, silent. He's dead. You have no authority to convict him. His sins are forgiven. Because he is in teshuvah. And from your perspective, Hasatan, he's not alive. This is the power of fasting. The first century fasted twice a week. And we wonder why they were the disciples. And why the power of God was so strong. They took life seriously. And they understood the power of death. How much do we? That was an irregular month. Lord knows what they did during the month of Elul. Or during times where Yahweh would call through, a, through the high priest or through a prophet or through a king an extended time of fasting. You never saw any of Esther's people go, Esther, you're not Yahweh. I don't have to do what you're telling me to do. They saw it as an opportunity to band together and do something corporately. What if everyone dies? Then everyone lives. Get it? This is why Yeshua, that's why it says you must be crucified with Christ. Or you cannot live with Christ. You must die. I'll never forget it. It was 1986. I was sitting in Kansas City Youth for Christ, L Bar C Ranch, a Christian youth ranch. I'm sitting on the floor and I'm listening to a message. 
and I had my first Bible that my grandmother gave me. I'll never forget it to this day. It was a New American Standard Bible, and I opened it up, and it has those lines, right? Like, uh, you know, from, to, date, all that. And in the middle of me doing this, I remember to this day, I was writing my name in there at that moment and writing a couple things and whatever the questions were. The speaker said this, because I was in junior high and I, I probably wasn't listening. But the speaker said something that opened my ears, my spirit made me stop what I was doing. And he said, it is a call of come and die. And I wrote it in my Bible because I've never heard anything that impacted me so much at that age. It's a call of come and die. It's not a call of come and be happy. It's not a call of come and be comfortable. It's not a call of come and be a king or be a servant or be a eunuch or whatever part of your body. It's a call of come and die to everything and everyone that surrounds you and everything you ever wanted, everything that you ever thought that you needed. And be the piece of wheat that he desires for you to be because bread that ends up in the holy place starts with a broken heart. It starts with a broken seed, a broken life. And so if you've been broken and you've been hurt and you've been crushed, you are this close to life. The only thing keeping you from fully becoming what the Father desires for you to be is to not recognize it was So do not despise the path you're on. Do not despise the path you are on. Our King sees all, knows all, and is in all. He has ordained your steps. To bring you and make you into the person that you are right now. I'm not saying that he condoned everything that you did. But he's so righteous and so loving that he's used even your worst sins to mold and make your character into somebody that you are now. And if you don't like who you are now, then fall on your face and die. Open your chest. Go to someone. Get it out. When people come for deliverance around here and they come for prayer, they might spend eight hours with the prayer team. Not realizing that they would be puking up things from their childhood. Things that they've done, things that people have done to them. Do you know what all that is? Someone taking their seed and shoving it down inside of your life. And what God is trying to do is extract the, the seeds that have come from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Pull it out of your life so that the only seed that is found in you brings life. Do not be afraid to let someone look down your throat. You say, no one's qualified to look down my throat. You're right. But he is. And he's going to do it. You either let him do it now through a faulty, broken human being that's trying, or you get called into his doctor's office on judgment day. I don't want my king to say, open up and say, ah. Ah. Because what he might see and find 
might be very painful. I would rather get my tonsils out now. I would even go as far as to say, this is what I've learned about people. We're all messed up. But here's the deal. Yahweh says this. He has no other plan. Did you know you're his plan? You're plan A. There's no plan B. There's no backup plan if we get it messed up. Yahweh gave it to 12 men and said, go out two by two, change the world. They say, well, what happens if we, if we get it wrong? He says, I don't know. You're it. And they're going, we're just fishermen. We're just farmers. He says, and go, and I will be with you. There is no plan B. This is why I take this ministry and my calling so critically with so much gravity. Because for me, I'm one of those weird people that can extract the entire world away from myself, take myself out of myself, and go, what if I was the only one? And there was one person in Tanzania, and we're the only people on the planet, and I knew the gospel, what would I do? Sit here, maybe build a boat, to ship myself to Hawaii because there's no one there, be a great place to be? Or would I spend my entire life doing everything I could to do something to talk to the one person that has never heard the name Yeshua? The name above all names. Well, praise the Lord, it's not just me. There's lots of people doing their part. On TV, on internet, on radio, no radio. Pastors of tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. Yahweh has built his structure. Man screws it up, I get it. Don't condemn what he's doing in the earth realm. Unless you want to fix it. So if the next time that you point your finger in the month of Elul, I dare you to take the person's place that you're pointing the finger at and do a better job. Because your spouse is doing everything she can. She's doing the best that she can. Your husband is doing the best that he can. You're both broken, messed up. Why don't you just admit you're both wrong, love each other, hold each other, pray with one another, and ask the Holy Spirit for help and comfort. Don't find it somewhere else. Don't find it anywhere else. The only thing you will find is gravel in your mouth and another seed in your stomach that he'll have to extract at some time in the future. Amen? Please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 21. <laughs> Are you going to let me talk today? No. That was all introduction to bring you to the point of this. These are the laws of war. I want to skip to verse 10 of 21. When you go out to war against your enemies, this is where they're already in the promised land. They've already defeated their enemies. So this is future instruction. When you go out to war against your enemies, and Yahweh your God delivers them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and desire her and would take her for your wife, then you shall bring her home to your house, and she shall shave her head and trim her nails. She shall put off the clothes of her captivity, 
remain in your house and mourn her father and mother for a full month. After, you may, after that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. And it shall be that if you have no delight in her, then you shall set her free. But you, shall certainly, you certainly shall not sell her for money. You shall not treat her brutally because you have humbled her. Well, that's a rough law if you don't have the context. If you have the context, it's beautiful. So let's dig into the ancient war customs for a second. One of the ancient customs of war, first of all, this is problematic if you know the Torah. Why? Because the Torah already says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, I think, that they can't marry foreign wives. But now he's saying they can, they can marry foreign wives. Which is it? Contradiction. Nope. God's smarter than we are. He said you're not allow, allowed to marry the foreign wives, and he lists the enemies in the land of Canaan. This is after that. These are enemies that, that they did not pick a fight. So Yahweh, when they come into the land of Canaan, he says, these are the guys I want you to get rid of. These are the bad guys. And by the way, just a total side note, I've taught on this before, most of the cities that he went and destroyed, he said destroy men, women, and children, had Nephilim in them. There was mixed blood in those communities. So he says the DNA, some of it's not even human, destroy everything, man, women, and child. Makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? But this is after that. So now when somebody comes and picks a fight with you, if you want, you have the right to choose a wife if you want to. But watch this. This is so incredible. This is one of the laws of hermeneutics of Torah interpretation is you can't look at the, at the law literally. You must understand the cultural context because some of it is humorous. This is actually a humorous law. Our atheist friends will say, this is why I don't serve God. They don't see the humor in it. They don't see what Yahweh's doing. So let's get into it. One of the cultural contexts is that when, when someone goes to war, it was understood in ancient customs that the, uh, the women would dress up in their most beautiful dresses because they knew there was a great potential that their husband could be killed. And they knew that there was a law that if you, if it, in wartime, if the men are killed, the women were automatically taken as slaves. It was an absolute law in ancient customs. And so if they're going to be a slave, and you knew that there was a really good chance that you were probably going to be husbandless, you wanted to look your best so that you did not get treated terribly. And without going into all the details, it was designed as a, sed as a seductive uh, role. Because if, if a woman could try to, to seduce the person that's coming, there's a greater chance she lives. Understand? So everybody would dress up in their Sunday best, if you will. And so this is what happens. They know they're going to be taken. They have to be provided for. So the law of taking someone, a woman as a slave was actually a welfare system. Now what happened was a lot of the pagan lands would abuse this terribly and treat those women terribly. No rights, nothing. Yahweh says, not on my watch. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to bring her home, and you're going to shave her head and trim her nails. And you have to wait 30 days. And then at the end of 30 days, if that gorgeous, and by the way, it says right here, you have to take off the clothes of her captivity. That's an idiom, meaning that gorgeous, beautiful bridal dress. So now you're going to see her 
on her Monday morning hair pulled back sweatpants with puke from the baby on her chest and a baby wipe in her right hand. And you're going to see her crying her eyes out, mourning for her mother and father with her hair shaved. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, God is trying to say, I want you to really make sure this is what you want. I'm going to let her, I'm not going to let her drip. I'm going to let her cry and cry and yell and scream and you can't do anything about it. For 30 days. Because the Torah says you have to mourn, you can mourn for 30 days for the dead. Total off work, everything, you're allowed to mourn for 30 days. So he gives them the rights of a Hebrew woman that's mourning for the dead. He says, they're not a slave. You want to bring her home and make her a wife, you're going to make sure that this is not lust. And so he says, I want you to bring her in, and I want you to do these things. And after 30 days, if you're still in love with that woman who hasn't taken a bath or a shower and screaming and bawling her eyes out, snotty face and everything, and you think she's still hot, totally bald, (laughs) then it might work. Do you want to see what this looks like? Go home, take a picture, give it to somebody, put it on Photoshop, take her hair off, This is what happened. If you don't have delight in her, in other words, at the end of the 30 days, if you're freaking out and you can't believe that you just had that moment of lust, let her go free. But you shall not sell her for money because that's what the pagans did. You shall not treat her brutally because you've humbled her. You've taken her covering her husband. First Corinthians chapter 11 should make a little bit more sense. The whole shaven thing, remember that? You shall be as one that is sh- shaven. What were the cult prostitutes? Hair or no hair? No husband. Cult prostitutes, young virgins, taken advantage of, hair shaved, no husband. Paul says, you need to have a hair, head covering. Ladies, you need to have a husband. And if you act, if you have a husband and you act against him, it is as if you are shaven. It's as if you don't have a husband and you're a cult prostitute. And he weaves it back and forth with the real physical head covering. It's beautiful. At the very end, he says, hey, if you want to wear a physical head covering, that's great. Because that's the custom in Corinth. But we don't have such custom. Because the hair itself shows, the long hair, that there is a husband. There's a covering. Amazing how the Scriptures come alive when we just put them right back into their Hebraic context. Amen? So this is great. The next law. See, we love to parse things out. Yahweh goes in order, I think. So he starts off by saying, if you want to take a wife, this is what you got to do. Then the next verse, in verse 15, says, if a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved. And if the firstborn son is of the one who's unloved, then it shall be on the day that he takes his possessions to his sons, that he leaves his possessions to his sons, that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son that he loves. It must be the firstborn, even if it's from the woman he can't stand. I think this is hilarious because he's connecting it to the first commandment. Listen, buddy. You go to war and you think she's hot and you take her home and you want her to be your wife. Understand that if you can't stand her and she gives you a son, you're required by my law to give all of your double portion inheritance to the son you can't stand. 
So you better be double careful who you marry. It's not independent. It's connected. All of the laws are connected. So then he connects it again. It goes again. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. I love the Word of God. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, Yahweh's trying to give them a hint. If you marry the woman that's bald and you end up hating her and she has a son that's your firstborn son, he's probably going to be rebellious because you don't love his mother. Ouch. And if he's rebellious because you don't love his mother, here's what's going to happen. Your name is going to be humiliated, and this is what you're going to be required to do. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and when they've chastened him, he will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take a hold of him, bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city. That's where the bait den was. There was real structure. There was no independent Hebrew contractors back then. They'd drag your backside to the gate of the city whether you like it or not. And it says, And they shall say to the elders of the city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. This is one of the most talked about and most mysterious commandments in all the Bible. In all the Torah. It's one that atheists love to bring up. Now look at that stone or children when they disobey. Mommy, I want to watch Barney. No, turn it off. I'm going to watch it anyway. Take him to the pastor, stone him. <laughs> Chapter verse, right here. Son, sorry you're rebellious. The elders agree. But I only wanted to watch Barney. Doesn't matter. Get on your face. That's not at all what this means. So let's get a little bit of more cultural context so you know. First of all, the ancient sages say that this never happened. They have not one single recorded time of this happening where it actually went this far that they have recorded. Maybe it did happen. But here's the reality behind it. This is a teenager. Teenagers? Moms? Here's your verse. This is a teenager that's rebellious, that will not listen to mom and will not listen to dad. And he eats too much meat. What, what, what does that mean in ancient times? He's selfish. What's happening is this is a poor generation. This is a poor society. This isn't like everybody living, you know, in, in uh, two-story houses here. When you ate too much meat, you're taking meat off the table for the rest of the family. That is very hard to come by. Because for those of you that have cows, you may not have a lot of cows. So when you kill one, it's a big deal to kill a fatted calf. That meat's got to go somewhere. It's got to go through all of your siblings and so on and so forth. So when you eat too much, you are being selfish and you are basically killing off the rest of the family, if you will. And then the second thing is, is he's a drunkard, which humiliates the family. And he might kill someone. So here's what they do. They actually had a test where they would say, you're, not allowed to, you're only allowed to eat uh, this such and such a measure of meat in this such and such a measure of wine. Now understand, wine is totally different back then. You didn't have like, you know, Coke and Pepsi products. You didn't even have lemonade. You basically had wine and water. And wine was, was used as an everyday drink uh, at dinner time. But if you drank too much, don't look at it when it has bubbles, the Bible says. So the teenager says, I'm going to look at it when it has too much bubbles, and I'll do what I want when I want. And he, get too, he, he would always drink too much and eat too much and lived for himself. Most of us have been there, teenager or not. And God says, okay, well, here's the deal. The context that you don't get is they brought him before the elders already, and they gave him the test. So this is his first rodeo. He knows exactly what's required of him, and he refuses to obey the elders of the city. 
And so he's now brought back in contempt of court. He was on probation. By the way, our system works exactly like this. He's in contempt of court, brought back before the judges. And what do they do? They stone him. This, is not a sm- this kid knows exactly what he's doing. He knows he will be stoned if he continues in his rebellion. But he doesn't care. So believe it or not, this is an act of mercy. You might say, this is the most terrible God I've ever met in my life. That would kill a kid because he's rebellious. He's rebellious on more than one occasion. He's a drunk. So let me put it in 21st century vernacular. You've got an 18-year-old kid who's high on testosterone. He's constantly drinking on Friday night. He's selfish and steals money, which is eating too much meat, stealing from his parents, drinking too much. He's driving drunk. How many people are going to die before we charge him? So the system was real simple. We know you're going to kill someone. It's only a matter of time before you end up in some bar brawl and you kill someone and you're going to be hightailing it to one of the cities of refuge. So before you are charged before the Most High God with murder, we are going to spare you that judgment and we're going to stone you now. We're going to end your life now because we know if you can actually rebel against the gates, the city gates, and the Torah, your parents on multiple occasions, and you can break your probation, then you have no regard for authority, you have no regard for Yahweh's word, and you know have no regard for human life. So your life must be taken, and trust me, we are doing you a favor. That adds a little bit of context. That adds a little bit of depth and gravity. And do we not do the same thing on a smaller level? We tell our teenager, praise the Lord, I don't have any like this. But I was one. (laughs) So I've heard these messages. The son I brought you into this world... I can take you out. I've had the messages of, if you do this, this will happen. And go figure, I would always take it to the limit. And then I would trip over the line and I would get that discipline. Good parents never back down from what they say. Terrible parents make a rule and then make an exception. The Bible says that if you don't discipline your children, you hate them. And if you don't hate them, you will. So discipline your children now while you have the opportunity so that when they are older, they will thank you for keeping them on the straight and narrow. Amen. My goodness, there's so many I wanted to go through. Let's just go through a few more. Oh, this is a good one. Verse 22, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, this is awesome, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is cursed of God. How many remember the Brit Hadashah of the New Testament? This is the scripture that it references when it's dealing with Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. He who is hung on a tree is accursed. He's hanging on a tree, ladies and gentlemen, not a cross. He's hanging on a tree with a cross beam. He's carrying a crossbeam, right? And then he's hung on a tree. This is the ancient custom. You were not allowed, according to the Torah, to hang anyone on a tree. It is illegal. Unless you went through the court system and the verdict was guilty penalty by hanging on a tree. There was only one way that you could hang someone publicly. 
And that was going through the proper biblical authorities. This is why what happened to Yeshua was illegal. This is why he was required to be raised from the dead by the Torah. Because there was an unjust hanging. There was no court system. How, how many remember the court system? It did happen, right? That night, late into the night, high priest comes in, having a bait in, illegally. The Torah said it had to be during the day. What did they do? They had a mockery trial in the middle of the night when no one was there to support the other side. It was a one-sided hanging. It was a one-sided jury. It was a jury that was picked by those who wanted to hang him. The verdict was obvious what it was going to be. So Yahweh, according to his own word, has to raise him from the dead. He has to make it right. Because he was jured wrong. He was judged unrighteously. Where does that come in today? How does this law happen today? Because we don't hang people on trees today. Oh, yes, we do. It's called Facebook. It's the tree of death. You laugh because it's so terribly true. We hang people. Don't we? The people that are, have the greatest gift of oratory are normally those that wear their emotions on their sleeve. Unfortunately, social engines of today have become the trees of yesterday where now they have a place to vent their emotions with no judge. No biblical court system. It's Caiaphas in the middle of the night blogging about people they don't like. Family members that hurt them. Friends that despised them. Their toe that got stepped on. We literally judge and hang people. And the Torah says, you're accursed if you hang someone illegally. It's against the law of God to hang in a public light. Unless it's given permission by the judges of the gates of the city. So if there's no gates of the city... Today we're in the dispersion, and, and there's no judges sitting at the gates. What do you think you ought to do according to Torah? Wait for the gates. Wait for the kingdom to come. Because that kingdom comes. His will will be done. And the gates will be very clear. And the judges will be very, very clear. Is this making sense? Isn't it beautiful how the Torah, the very Torah that all of us have grown up thinking is old and yesterday and despising and no relevance. Is the most relevant book, most revel relevant word It's no wonder that the writer of Timothy says this in chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good and when this was written, there's only one scripture. That was what we call the front of the book. 
It would behoove us to read our Bibles more slowly. I would encourage you to do your study more thoroughly. Do not listen to the denominational backgrounds and the backdrops and the biasness that's been planted. The seeds, some good, some not so good. What we need to do is open our chest to the Most High God and let the light of His just the crack of the door penetrate you so that you see that everything that's happened in your life has been used for His glory to get you to where you're at. Don't despise Egypt. Egypt is where you've been for 400 years and Egypt was the place that Yahweh sent His people. You were sent into whatever church you grew up in. Don't despise it. He used it. It was your Egypt. Is he calling you to a greater place? Absolutely. Will he call you to a greater place? Absolutely. And while you are here in Passion for Truth, in this place, I give you my word that I will do my best to be an example, to open my chest and let the light of God come out and any darkness that is found will be exposed. That was only the beginning. Maybe next year. When we come back around to this Torah portion, may we start where we left off and go through a few more. Because every commandment is there for a purpose. Every commandment is there to inspire you to be more like Him. Every instruction is designed to point an arrow back to the first seed. The tree of knowledge of good and evil? No. The tree of life. Every single penned character, jot or tittle, is there for a reason. Can I say that you and your life is a written Torah? Every jot and every tittle. So whoever you would call a jot and whoever you would call a tittle, they're there for a reason. Every stroke of the Bible is there for a purpose. And every stroke of your life is the same. Listen, my friends. If Yeshua claims to be the Word of God and is, and the Word of God is Genesis to Revelation, and you claim that He lives inside of you, then you are every jot and tittle. Your life is one long journey from Genesis to Revelation. What if the Israelites were able to remove all the terrible things that happened to them? Would we have anything to learn from? If you don't go through the difficult trials and tribulations in your life, will your friends, family, children, or grandchildren have anything to hear from you? You have nothing to say. No wisdom. Wisdom does not come through age. That is worldly wisdom. Biblical wisdom comes through knowing how to take the experiences of age and connect them to the Word. 